politics. Uh, it's been infused in debates uh, in every sort of form you can think of related to the elections uh, that are coming up. What I want to do essentially is break up this talk into two sections. I want to give sort of a background uh, to voting rights history, and then after I do that, I will go through a slideshow that's more empirical with some data that's pretty current about some of these uh, restrictive voting laws. So let me just start with, with my background as a political scientist. The way we teach American politics, we sort of teach it as a history as progress narrative, which is not very accurate, actually. And now I feel bad for some of the undergrads I taught in past years about voting rights. Uh, but that was my mistake. I was ignorant. And what I mean by this is essentially voting rights have come a very long way, but they often go forward and then they take some big steps back, and then they go forward again. Uh, the most salient uh, example of this that many of you, probably all of you, are aware of is uh, African Americans in the South. Right? Uh, after the Civil War in 1870, the 15th Amendment is passed, and it gives African American males right, the right to vote. Uh, and, and we'll see that, that those rights are lost. Okay? They're not really protected and secured, and it takes almost another 100 years later to get those rights back. Uh, so that's just the, the most salient example, uh, I would say, of, of rights that were acquired and, and then removed. Uh, many of you probably don't know this, but in a state like New Jersey, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, women were voting in New Jersey okay, because of federalism. States can have different laws, uh, but New Jersey then rescinded that right. And I think around 1907, and women could no longer vote again until 1920 when we get the 19th Amendment. Uh, to the Constitution. And so if you really think about the history of voting rights, it, it really does have sort of this progressive move forward and then it goes back. And it looks like right now we're in one of those moments, again, where we see we've come very far and then perhaps we're taking some steps backward. Okay? Uh, so let me just give you sort of a, a little history here, just sort of going through time with, with what the vote looks like, the franchise. Uh, many of you are aware of some of the major amendments, right? I just mentioned the 15th, uh, black uh, males could vote 1870, 19th Amendment, women, uh, 24th Amendment, 1964, was poll taxes. They, they were removed in federal elections. And then in 66, all poll taxes were removed uh, through a court case uh, in Virginia. And then we get the Voting Rights Act, which is incredibly historic in 1965, and then as many of you no, the 26th Amendment, where you get uh, the right to vote dropped down to 18 years of age uh, uh, and older from 21 uh, at the federal level, and that, of course, applies everywhere. So let me just start at the founding of the Republic. And, and I, again, I'll be pretty quick moving through this because I really want to get to the guts of this slideshow <coughs> and let you all see some of the stuff I've put together here to show you just how controversial these laws are. Okay? So, at the founding of the Republic, right around 1789, until about 1820, uh, we really see this tiny electorate. <laughs> it's very small, right? We're thinking of propertied white males and in many states, religious qualifications. Okay? So it's a very, very small circumscribed electorate. Uh, democracy wasn't really a popular word back then, okay? <laughs> and there wasn't much of it, right? It wasn't really a democratic system at the time. There just weren't enough voters. But something very interesting happened after 1824. 1824 was an extremely controversial presidential election, right? Uh, many people called it the corrupt bargain because Andrew Jackson won the popular vote, but he couldn't get a majority of the Electoral College, which you need to be the next president. Uh, a deal was cut in the House of Representatives because you have to go through that if you can't get a majority of the Electoral College vote. And uh, John Adams won, John Quincy Adams won. Well, something really amazing happened in American politics between 1824 and 1828. Uh, so here, here's the numbers on the number of, of votes cast for president in 1824. 365,833. Okay? So think about a calendar year, about 365,000 votes. Okay? Four years later, the vote was 1,148,018 cast. Okay? It was almost tripled. Right? Could you imagine? We, couldn't even, we don't even have the population to do that. Okay? That's sort of math these days. Right? Think about that. 
the vote, the franchise exploded in terms of the number of voters in four years. Right? Almost tripled the electorate in terms of votes cast. Why did this happen? Well, after Andrew Jackson lost, he and a fellow named Martin Van Buren, right, who later became his vice president after John C. Calhoun was his first term, Martin Van Buren understood that we have to expand the electorate to more people who are of a lower class, right? Because if we can do that, then those people will support Andrew Jackson, okay? Jacksonian Democrats, eventually, as we call them. And that's what happened, okay? And so you expand the electorate for a partisan reason, okay? So the vote in many states, religious qualifications, property qualifications, they started to fall by the wayside in this era that we roughly pegged from about 1828 when Jackson is, is elected to about 1854, right, before we get to the Civil War. Okay? So again, what am I saying with this era of American politics? The, the franchise is greatly expanded because of partisan reasons, because of partisan gain. That's a common theme in what I'm going to tell you. Okay? So we get a Civil War, and I always have fun when I teach American politics because we don't spend much time on it. Oh yeah, we had this war, then we move on. Oh yeah, 600,000 plus people died. Okay? Uh, the most incredible, the most important, the most consequential event in American history, the Civil War. Okay? After the Civil War, right, we had these 11 Confederate states. Tennessee actually comes in early. Okay? They, get, they get to go back in early. Uh, but the, the rest of the southern states, there's provisions for them to come back into the Union, right? Because they did secede. And so radical Republicans in Congress essentially say, you're going to have to comply with certain laws to come back into the United States. Well, when these states want to come back into the Union, they're going to be overwhelmingly Democratic. Okay? There's no question about that. So Republicans in the North understand that. We let these states back in, they're going to be overwhelmingly democratic. We could lose our majorities. Okay? So the African American becomes central to this question when these states are put back into the Union. And so certain provisions, we call them the Civil War Amendments, some people do, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. Okay? 13th, abolishing slavery, uh, 14th Amendment, citizenship, equal protection, all kinds of provisions in there. And then the 15th again, suffrage for, for black males. Okay? So those are the provisions that these states have to abide by to come back into the Union. Now also many of the, the, uh, the white natives who, who were part of the, the Confederacy, they're disfranchised. Okay? And those who aren't are sort of disfranchised by themselves voluntarily because in many of these states they have to go and register. And so many of them just don't. Okay? And so what you see is that uh, Republicans in the North understand if we can enfranchise African Americans, we know how they're going to vote. <laughs> None of them are going to vote Democratic. Why on earth would they? And so during Reconstruction, if you want to say it's around 1866 after the Civil War till about 1876, you have uh, black males enfranchised in the South and they're voting heavily Republican. Uh, and, at, and with the Northern Coalition of whites in these Southern states during military occupation, who are also voting Republican, you have these narrow Republican majorities even in, in, in many of these southern states. Okay? So again, why do we get the, the expansion of the right to vote? Well, it's partisan, again. Right? Republicans had a direct interest in expanding uh, suffrage for African Americans. It's not because they're uh, such magnanimous people. Right? It's a partisan motive. Well, same when if, if we fast forward after Reconstruction, and, and we go into, say, the late 18, uh, 1800s to the turn of the century, uh, you know, 1880s, 1920s, what have you all call that? What would you call that era? Anyone know? Ray would know. The, the progressive era. Okay? You, it, it should probably, revisionist history, we should go back and call it the regressive era, not the progressive era, okay? Because the progressive era was filled with all kinds of restrictive voting measures, right? Who were progressives? Good government people. They wanted to clean up politics. Why? Because these urban political machines were extremely powerful in the late 1800s, at the turn of the century. Well, who were the people who voted and supported political machines? Well, in cities, they were Catholic, immigrant, not native stock, okay? poor, working class, 
So these are the kinds of elements that progressives didn't want to see have power. Okay? And so what kinds of laws do you get to combat this, uh, especially in northeastern cities? Well, registration. Okay? Now you have to register yourself. That's a cost. Right? That's one of the things we should always mention in a, in a talk like this. It's about costs. Right? Costs versus benefits when you cast a vote. Okay? Registration is costly. Uh, one of the, the leading political science articles on this says that registration alone probably decreases turnout in the United States by about 10 percentage points. Okay? Uh, that's substantial, right? especially if it disproportionately affects some people rather than others. Uh, and, and that can be the point. Uh, why do you have mayoral elections, city council elections that are nonpartisan? Because then people don't know who to vote for. Why should I show up? Okay? I knew when I saw the rooster, the donkey. Okay? <laughs> When you move that, when you take that away, I'm not sure who to vote for, right? Uh, so, so that's another issue as well. The secret ballot, okay? How can your supporters really, uh, how can you trust your supporters if you don't know how they voted now, right? The secret ballot, the Australian ballot, because it comes from Australia. How can you cut the deal, so to speak? So all these sorts of progressive reforms in voting, the bottom line is they really shrunk the electorate, okay? Uh, and it was obviously uh, more severe in the South. Okay, the southern version of the progressive era, what do we see? Is there anything progressive about a white primary? Okay? <laughs> Where the Democratic Party essentially says, well, we're really a private party, and if you're not white, then you can't vote. Okay? The, clearly the most restrictive measure that we saw uh, during the Jim Crow era in the South. Uh, the poll tax, right? which also you know, harms poor whites, not just African Americans. Right? Uh, literacy tests, which of course are not you know, administered in a way that, that is judicious, uh, to say the least. Understanding clauses. Did you really, can you tell me what this means? Okay. So all these shenanigans under Jim Crow, uh, by around 1910, uh, J. Morgan Kauser, a famous historian, he wrote a very uh, important book called The Shaping of Southern Politics. He says that less than 10% of the black male voting age population was registered to vote by 1910. Okay. So these laws just really sucked the life out of a huge part of the electorate. How did you get a, a dominant one-party uh, white Democratic South? Well, that's how you did it. Okay? You did it through these restrictive voting measures. Uh, and if that didn't work, you used violence. Right? Uh, violence isn't given enough play, I don't think, among academics. We, perhaps we don't know enough about it. Right? Uh, but you use the measures that you can. Um, let me say something about women before I move from 1920, the, this progressive era I just talked about, to the New Deal era. Women's suffrage is really interesting because, again, the, the examples I've given you, you can see how there's a partisan motivation to restrict certain people in the electorate. That's why women are such a problem in American politics. Okay? What do you mean a problem? What I mean is that men didn't know how they would vote. Okay? There was an unknown there. Now, men were chauvinist, okay? That's clear, right? But the question is, what happens if we, if we give women the franchise? We don't know, okay? It's not clear what they're going to do. And most empirical evidence suggests that, at least in the early part, uh, when women were, were re-enfranchised in 1920, under the 19th Amendment, they didn't vote much different from their, their husbands, from their partners, okay? And so it was sort of about 70-plus years of a bit to do about nothing, okay? Uh, at least partisan, in terms of partisan political terms, re-enfranchising women didn't have that big effect on partisan election outcomes. Just didn't. Okay? Now it does now. Okay? Since the late 70s, Ronald Reagan, you get into the 80s, there's this sort of perpetual gender gap in voting that we see. Right? Women more Democratic, men more Republican. Right? But we didn't see that gender gap when, when women got the franchise. It took 70 plus years of women fighting uh, for suffrage. <laughs> you know, if you go back to Seneca Falls Convention, eight, 1848, do the math. <laughs> 1920, finally, you get a constitutional amendment uh, giving women suffrage. 